So we're going to first cover uh, sampling and the needs and designs. And this talk is going to be just going back to the basics and covering the kind of general approaches. And then Kustub uh, is going to take you through a fun exercise with Lego. So first, though, we want to just cover a few things with this presentation. So coming back to quantitative ecology, so often our goal in conservation biology is to understand and prevent biological loss, right? So quantitative methods like math, stats, can really help us as scientists, as conservationists, develop these tools that are replicable and reliable. So that's our key message also today. We want to, to help you develop and use surveys that are really replicable and are more rigorous in terms of uh, assessing whether your surveys have any bias or certain errors. And then in that way, not only do you provide evidence for your conservation work, but you provide really rigorous evidence for the conservation approaches um, that you put in. So let's, let's dive in. Let's start simple and first understand some parameters. So, which are especially important for spatial capture, recapture, and, under, and camera trap surveys. So the first one is abundance, so which is the total number. So this is uh, rather simple, but go ahead and tell me how many, um, let's pretend these are ibex, are there in our study area. Go ahead, feel free to count and write it into in the comments section. Hope it will come up for me. So the total number is around, it is actually, and uh, you can count them, is 20, yeah, let me look at the chat section. Yeah, that's right, it's 20 ibex. Um, and so, if there are 20 ibex here, what is the density? So the density looks at the number in a certain area. And we're gonna pretend that our study area, which is the kind of uh, the box, is 10 kilometers squared. So the density would be the total number divided by the area A. So just again, if you wanna write in the chat section what you think the density is for the whole study area, which is demonstrated by the big box. So to take you through it, it would be 20n, yeah, divided by 10. Very nice, Fuji, which equals two animals per square kilometer. So just um, what's really nice about density, um, which also spatial capture recapture helps us assess, is we can also compare between study areas if we use the same, um, same scale. With through density, you can also go back to abundance if you change um, the formula, as you can see here. So if we do want to quantify abundance and we, we want to estimate everything, how would we go about and do this? Maybe we would go around and just go and count everything, right? If this was like a farm or maybe someone's garden, um, we would go around and count. But what if things got really difficult. There were many more ibex in your garden or across a whole mountain area. It would get a little bit more difficult to go and count your ibex. It might be possible, but a bit more difficult. And then here, what happens here? When the numbers get really tricky, there's many, many ibex. And as you get more and more numbers, the, uh, the ability to reliably count your animal gets very difficult and challenging. And in the real world, it's even more challenging because sometimes you can't detect your ibex, your animal. Um, and for example, detection of vegetation, here we put the trees as an example because there might, some might be hidden in the vegetation. What if your survey is carried out during the day, but your animal is active at night, then detection will be very low, but the animals are actually still there. And also, you might not be able to access all of these, all areas. So this is especially the case for snow leopards, right? Because we work in very a mountain habitat and we can't always access the high mountain areas because they're so steep and they are, can be dangerous to access. So can we say there are, there are no snow leopards there when they actually might be using those areas and are actually there? So that's, it's important to consider detection. Um, and that's why we brought that up. Um, 
but today we're not really going to go too much into detection, but we'll cover it later. But we wanted to highlight how when you can't access the whole study area, you can do sampling. And sampling can be achieved by, for example, just surveying a subset of your study area. So in simple terms, it's the process of collecting information from one or more representative subsets of the entire study area. So in this case, we assumed that these red grids were randomly put across the study area. And in this way, they are representative and they reduce bias. But before we go more into this, so we'll, we'll explain a little more, more about this, it's important to define your questions. So at the very beginning, even before you go ahead and sample, what are you trying to quantify? Is it abundance? Is it density? Or maybe it's something else like occupancy or habitat use of the species. So it's really important to define this and then to decide what method you're, you plan to do. And the method is the how. So once you know um, the how is, is trying to understand how will you sample in a way that is replicable and also reduces bias. When will you go out to, be, uh, to, to quantify the species? And also, where should it be quantified? And this is really about de defining your samples um, in order to reduce bias. So let's go into that a little bit more. In this case, for example, um, the population is distributed evenly across our study area. And we assuming this is, assume it's like a, a, a forestry and the plants were planted like this. So they're distributed evenly. And if you place your sample, which is the red grid, you would get uh, a certain number of uh, plants in your grid. As you can see, if you put it in one place and another place, it actually gets the same number of plants, which would, we, here we assume the count, which is equal to the count, is 12. So 12 plants. So these samples are actually representative of the entire population. So let's, let's check if they are actually representative of the entire population. And in this case, so I want you to calculate, in this case, what is density and what is abundance? So let's look at the parameters. So we have A, which is the area of unit, right? And that's the area of our sampling grid. The small area, A, would be area of unit which is the grid size. And then you ha would have the C, which is the count, which in this case is 12. And then you would have the D, which is density. And density would be how many individuals per sampling unit. So here uh, you can see at the bottom, we can calculate D, which is count divided by area of unit. So does anyone want to uh, assess what D might be? And based on D, then you can calculate abundance, which is density times total area, which we have here. So go ahead, try to calculate D and N, and feel free to ask any questions on if this doesn't make sense. So the formulas are right here for you to refer to. And we're interested in understanding density and abundance. So, yes, very good. I see some numbers coming in. Yes. Thank you, Barkat, and uh, good job, everyone else. So D is C divided by A. So that would be 12 points divided by 0 0.4. And that's why it actually equals 30. And then N, because it's 30, density is 30, is just times the total area. In this case, we assume is 10 kilometers squared. So the total population would be 300. But the point is, so very good, that's really good guys, because we're gonna go into a few more complicated examples. But I think the take home message here is that if you sampled 
different areas of this whole study area, you would get the same number for density and total number. You see here, each sample still has a count of 12. So in this case, maybe you would only need two or three samples because they are representative of their whole study area. But in real life with animals, this is not maybe the case, unfortunately. And animals do not tend to be uniformly distributed. They might be clumped, they might be um, randomly distributed or along some gradient. So it's important to consider that when we sample. So here, in this case, we're gonna sample randomly because we're gonna assume that this population of Ibex are distributed randomly and we've put six grid cells across our study area randomly. And that allows us to, to some extent, have a representative assessment of the population. So I would like to ask you to calculate density and abundance in this case, but we're gonna go take it step by step. So first we need to assess how many samples there are in each grid. So we've labeled these grid, grids A to E, and we're going to look at how many there are. And in this case, we can see in grid A, we counted four Ibex. In grid B, we counted four and so on. So you can see that we tally up for each sample how many Ibex. And then we calculate the mean in our, across all of our samples. That so You can see the formula here. It's basically adding up the total from across our samples divided by how many samples we have, which is six in this case. So my question now is for you guys, can you estimate density and abundance using this mean count here for across your samples? So it's the same formula as you just previously did with density being count over, over area. So I think, sorry, just to, yeah, here's the area of unit, which is our sampled unit, and our total area, again, is 10 kilometers squared. So this time, calculate density using the mean count, and go ahead and then calculate total population abundance. Nice, some, and, uh, some responses are coming in. Very good, guys. So we have an estimate for 35 for density and 350 for abundance. Yeah, it's very nice sh explaining also how you did it. I think that helps others. So yes, very good. I see a lot of similar answers coming in. And we'll have, if density will be 3.5 divided by 0 0.1, um, which gives it a density, an, av an average of 35 animals uh, of density uh, per square kilometer. And then for the entire study area, we'll have 35 times 10 kilometers squared, which is 350 animals per this whole study area. But the truth is, do you guys remember how many animals we had said there were really in the study area? We had said there were actually 300 Ibex. So is our estimate wrong? How come we're getting 350? Well, the truth is that this estimate of density and abundance is just an estimate as we're just collecting a proportion of information from our population. And there's errors associated with that estimate. So we need the, the point here in this diagram and is to remind everyone that we need to report our errors. We need to be honest about our data and provide an indication of how accurate or how reliable our estimate is. And in this case, how would you do that? Well, you could report the standard deviation, which would be one, or the 95 confidence level, which would range from 2.7 to 4.3 in the actual mean of the count. 
and that would help you estimate how what that would be for density and then for abundance. So that's what we wanted to highlight here today. Because our sample does not include all the members of the population, there is a difference between our sample and the population, and this is what we consider an error. And it's kind of a notation uh, denoting the uncertainty. So that's, uh, that's just to introduce you to that concept. So I'll let now turn over to Kustu, who's gonna take that a little bit further, and we're gonna move on to playing a little bit with Lego to understand that visually. Um, and yeah, over to you, Kustu. Uh, 